Hi guys, welcome back to Cryptids Canada, Chapter 29. But before I get started, I keep forgetting to tell you guys this, it's so sweet. Uh, so my grandchildren are always trying to one-up each other. And uh, so the latest thing is they're calling you guys the Triple C's, <laughs> Cryptids Canada Crew. And they keep asking me, have I told you yet? Have I told you yet? What do they think, Grandma? Do they like it? <laughs> so anyways, I just wanted to let you know that that's what you're called around here. Okay, guys, let's get on with this chapter 29. It's coming to an end. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so as I ran, I felt the sensation of eyes boring into the back of my skull. It felt like I was inside someone's scope and I was about to be picked off. I had the urge to duck and weave, strangely enough. As I approached the deck, the sliding glass door flung open and Lisa flew into my arms. Are you okay? She cried breathlessly. Yes, yes, I'm fine. The look on her face told me she was confused and scared. I thought that Bigfoot was going to kill you. I kept thinking it was going to happen any second. Why did you two just stand there staring at each other? I smiled at her and said, We were speaking telepathically. Really? asked Scott. I've got a lot to tell you guys, but first we have to get prepared. She left because the bad ones are coming. At hearing that news, everyone jumped to attention. Lisa got the kids upstairs. Scott ran for the rest of the guns. I went about closing curtains and locking doors. Kathy shut off all the lights. John stood in the middle of the dining room, taking it all in. After we were all done our various tasks, we all dispersed to a window so we could watch the perimeter lights and see where they would attack from first. Listen, Brad, I have notified the sheriff's office and my office. I told them the child came back on her own and that it was simply a misunderstanding. If I had told them what really happened, you would have a war zone on your hands. There are people who will hunt and kill them just to prove their existence, and I'm sure you don't want that, whispered John. I nodded my head in agreement, but I think he would have been surprised to hear what I really had to say on the subject, especially when it came to Yemma and his clan, and especially after they took my daughter. At the moment, I wasn't too keen on them, I felt like he hadn't heard any of the hell stories that we had told him earlier about the attacks that we've had to endure over the last 10 months or so. As John headed for the front door, I asked him where he was going. I was shocked he was leaving already, especially now when he had the chance to witness firsthand what these things were capable of doing. They already need me in another location, so I'm going to try to beat the storm. But if you need me for anything, I can be reached by Sal, okay? And I would really appreciate it if you guys could all have my back when it comes to my story, he said, closing the front door behind him. We all stared out the door as it closed. He is too weird, Kathy said, breaking the silence. She said it, and we were all thinking it. I'd like to know how we are supposed to convince Mandy to say she just went for a walk by herself, Kathy continued. Where is Mandy? Is she okay? I asked. Yes, she seems fine, Lisa answered. I just put her upstairs with the girls, remember? Lisa asked with concern all over her face. I nodded and began to tell them what took place between me and Brisa. I had just finished when all hell began to break loose. We heard Brianna and Jenny screaming, Dad, Dad, as they came running down the stairs. Look outside, they yelled, running to the sliding glass doors. We all jumped up and ran to the doors where the girls were standing, looking outside. They're coming, Brianna yelled. They were running like dogs. When I looked out to the pasture, I could see at least eight black shapes running very quickly down on all fours. They looked like a cross between a chimpanzee and a dog, 
and they were heading straight for the house. Get upstairs, Lisa yelled to the girls. Where's Mandy, I asked as they were heading down the hall. She fell asleep in my bed, said Brianna, as she ran up the stairs. I couldn't stop thinking about Brisa. I hope she made it somewhere safe. Now I knew why she was so afraid. I wondered what it must feel like to have almost everyone she knew and loved wiped out over greed. I also wondered why she stayed here by herself and why she was possibly risking her life to try to help us. Lisa and I stood together behind the wall that separated the living room from the kitchen. Scott and Kathy stood in the hall, looking out into the kitchen. We could just make out each other's silhouettes by the lighting that filtered through the blinds and drapes. They should be here by now, I whispered. I was just about to creep into the kitchen when we heard the first cries of alarm by the three horses in the barn. After that, it was just gut-wrenching to imagine what was happening from the sounds we were hearing, crashing and banging as we imagined the horses kicking and rearing up. The cows were making sounds we never heard before. It was loud and horrifying. Poor Kathy stood covering her ears, repeating her horses' names over and over as she sobbed. I prayed the girls didn't realize what was going on. After about twenty minutes, it began to quiet down. Scott and I snuck into the kitchen window to see if we could get a glimpse of them. What we saw made us regret not staying where we were. One by one, the creatures came around the side of the barn from the back doors. They stood staring at the house from the other side of the pasture fence. We estimated that they were between six and nine feet tall, with long black matted hair and massive shoulders. Two of them were obviously female. They all looked different from Brisa. Brisa had long and beautiful shiny reddish-brown hair with a very feminine face. She was tall and shapely. These females were covered head to toe in black hair. Even their faces were covered. And they were built like the males except for large breasts that hung low on their waists. We stood staring at them from behind the curtains. They couldn't possibly see us but it felt like they were staring right back at us. What are they waiting for? asked Scott. I'm not sure, I answered. I noticed that Kathy wasn't crying as hard as she was a few minutes earlier. Scott knocked my shoulder and nodded in the direction of the barn as I was looking towards the other side of the lawn, thinking they might try to purposely keep our attention on them, leaving the rest of the perimeter unguarded. Just as I turned my attention to the crowd of Bigfoot, the first scream erupted, then followed by a guttural roar so loud the dog started crying. Then, as fast as it started, it stopped. It was deathly quiet. We waited and we watched. Just when it seemed like the worst was over, there was a loud bang that came from the inside of the barn. I noticed the light pointing out from the back of the barn went on. It might have been loose, and the bang may have given it a boost to light up. I could see that the creatures had shifted their attention to the back of the barn, and then, as if on cue, a massive Bigfoot walked into the light. It was staring at the house as it made its way to the fence where the other creatures stood. As it approached the group, they split into two groups, allowing the room for the one big one to come up the center. When it reached the fence, I noticed it had something under its arm in a headlock position. My attention shifted when the creature stepped over the fence with ease. The top of the fence was nearly four feet tall. I must have been in some sort of shock because I hadn't even noticed what the creature was dragging behind him until Scott said, Oh my God, it's a cow. He lifted a cow over the fence. I had to blink my eyes two or three times to make sure of what I was seeing. 
the creature walked halfway up the lawn with the perimeter light shining right on him. He looked much like the rest of his clan, except his fur seemed to be neatly groomed, not matted like the rest of them. He stood at least a foot taller and was almost double the size across the shoulders. His eyes were deep set and all black. I couldn't make out any whites around his pupils. His lips were thick and wide. It looked like I could fit two fists in his mouth at the same time. When I finally forced myself to look away from his face, I looked at our cow that he still had in a headlock as he dragged her behind him. When he stopped, he let the cow loose and she fell to the ground. She lay there stunned for a few moments and then started to struggle to get to her feet as the creature stood still looking right at us through the little curtain-covered window. When the cow finally got to her feet, the creature sidestepped over to her, never taking his eyes off of us. He put a hand on the back of her head and one on her nose, and in one quick, powerful twist, he broke the cow's neck. The bones breaking could be heard throughout the house, and at the same time we heard the girls scream from upstairs. They must have been watching from their bedroom window. When I heard the girls scream, I instinctively looked down the hall in that direction. When I looked back at the creature, I saw him staring up at the second floor window, and then I swear I saw him smile. He turned his attention back to us. He looked down at the cow that had fallen at his feet. He kneeled down and plunged his fist into the upper stomach and pulled out what I think was her liver and then proceeded to eat it right in front of us. Get upstairs, I whispered. What? Scott said, tearing his attention from the creature. Get the girls and get upstairs now. I had noticed while the one big one was putting on his show that there were only four creatures standing at the fence. Then I noticed one slink away to the far side of the barn, and I realized they were already most likely surrounding the house and were moments away from breaking through the windows. We all made it to the hall. I was just bolting the door when the bedroom window started smashing. I wasn't sure if the creatures were in the house or were they using tree limbs and rocks to break the windows but I wasn't slowing down for nothing. I got the door to the bottom of the stairs locked and bolted as a heavy body hit it from the other side. We got to the top of the stairs and looked at each other as if to say this was going to be our last night alive. I wouldn't lie. I was terrified. Not a death, but the whole act of achieving death. I was terrified for my family. I would pray that the doors held, but after witnessing what I had just witnessed, I had my doubts. I called Lisa, Scott, and Kathy into Jenny's room to talk. All three girls were huddled in Brianna's bed. We could hear the odd thumps downstairs, but for the most part, it was quiet. There was whooping and loud growling sounds coming from the different directions outside, but for the most part, they were staying out of sight for some reason. Each of us was armed to full capacity. Now it just felt like a waiting game. Did you see the way that big one seemed to smile when he heard the girl scream? Scott asked. Yeah, I answered. But I don't think it was the smile because he made the girl scream. I think he smiled because now he knew where they were. Then once again, as if on cue, the girl started screaming. When we got to Brianna's room, the three girls were huddled in the corner of the bed. Brianna was leaning against the two younger sisters, pushing them as far back into the corner as she could, as she pointed to the window. There's nothing there, Brianna, I yelled over the screaming and crying. She shook her head no, and then forced out that there was a Bigfoot looking in the window, and it was laughing at them. Honey, we are two stories up. They can't get up to this window without a ladder, and I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have a clue of how to use a ladder. I smiled. Lisa and Kathy sat on the end of the bed, promising to stay with them. 
All three kids clearly felt relieved to hear that because they settled down and tried to get some sleep. Scott and I crept back into Jenny's room to keep an eye out her window. We could see the wind was picking up. The first flakes of snow were starting to fly. That's just great, said Scott. On top of everything else we may have to deal with tonight, we still have a stupid snowstorm. Then he turned around and walked towards the bed to sit down. When I turned my attention back to the window, I came face to face with a giant Bigfoot. It looked me right in the eye, and after a few seconds, he smashed his hand against the glass as if he was going to try to grab my face. Then he turned and jumped down to the ground. I was really amazed to see that when he landed, it wasn't the landing of a 600-pound creature. It was balletic and fluent. He didn't hesitate to regain composure, as you would think, but stood and walked away almost gracefully. I turned to Scott and I asked if he had seen it. Was it at this window now? He asked as he jumped up, came back to the window. I nodded. Scott, they want us dead, I said. What did it just do to make you believe that more now than you did before, he asked. I stared past Scott, feeling the bile rise in the back of my throat. I could feel my insides tremble. I had never looked into the eyes of evil until that moment. I never knew hatred could reach the level it did with these creatures. And I didn't even know why. I'm sending Lisa and the kids back to the city in the morning, I said still staring out the window. I think you and Kathy should go too. No, man, I'm not leaving you to fend for yourself. This is as much my fight as yours, Brad. What are you thinking about? Something bad must have happened to them to make them hate us so much. Breeza insinuated that Yemma wasn't so bad when he came here after being hunted by humans, even though some of his clan were. She said Yemma's clan killed almost all her clan so that they could take their home. But she doesn't believe that Yemma was behind it. She said he turned bad after. But why? What turned him bad? I wondered. Well, it doesn't look like he wants to sit down and chat with you anytime soon, Scott chuckled. We need to find out more about the last owners. Find out why these creatures have had it out for us and not any other neighbors that we know of. How? asked Scott. Didn't the owner's daughter, Annette Livingston, move overseas? Yeah, but what about her younger brother, the one Kathy's friends with? Maybe he can shed some light on things. Oh yeah, I wonder why he didn't just stay here. Maybe he had a falling out with his mom before she died said Scott. Yeah, maybe, I agreed, turning my attention towards the window again. This time, I stood back a step or two. I was surprised to see the snow falling as heavily as it was when moments earlier it was just light flurries. The storm is here, I said to Scott. Scott got up and crossed over to the window. Oh, wow, he said. Hey, Brad, look, he said, pointing out to the pasture. When I looked, I could just make out a bunch of black forms retreating on all fours back into the woods. We called quietly to Lisa and Kathy to come into Jenny's room. They just retreated into the woods, I said happily. Really? Kathy squealed. Wait, said Lisa. How do we know there isn't one or two waiting for us to come out? Because I counted them earlier, and there were 14 of them total, including the big one and I counted them just before they slipped into the woods. They were all there, answered Scott. It took a few moments to work up the courage to go down the stairs. Once I was at the bottom with Scott standing directly behind me, I quietly unbolted the lock. Both of the guns were loaded and ready to be fired. Sweat beads appeared on my upper lip, and my heart pounded louder than I ever remember hearing it before. I turned around and gave Scott one final look to make sure he was ready. When I got the nod, I took a deep breath and I held it as I opened the door. The first thing I noticed when I finally allowed myself to breathe 
was the smell. It was overbearing. It was a combination of skunk, garbage, wet dog, and feces. We ignored it and continued down the hall towards the bedrooms. We came to the guest room first. It was just how we left it, next to the master bedroom. It, too, was basically untouched, except for the broken window. Last was Mandy's room. It wasn't so lucky. Her bed was tossed over onto its side, and her dresser was knocked over. Her window was smashed as well. It could have been worse, Scott whispered. I nodded in agreement. Are you still good to continue on? Yeah, let's do this, Scott replied. I slid open the bolt on the hallway door leading to the kitchen and dining room. Again, we were hit with an intense stink that we had encountered in the hall. Beside the odd thing on the floor here and there, there really wasn't any damage done. It was more like they were just curious more than anything. In my mind, I pictured them picking up one object or another, looking at it, then throwing it to the ground. Otherwise, there was nothing out of the ordinary. We found the back sliding glass doors wide open. They had figured out that there was a piece of wood lying lying in the bottom of the track, preventing the door from being slid open, and they figured out how to unlock the door as well. This thought disturbed me, and when I mentioned it to Scott, he agreed, saying that they were much more intelligent than we had given them credit for, which was exactly what I'd been thinking. We did a quick patch job on the two bedroom windows, which would only keep out the snow. It would be a very cold night, so we decided to go back upstairs and just stay up there for the night. Plus, we didn't know if they were intending to come back or not. The four of us sat up well into the night, keeping watch out the bedroom windows and discussing the situation. Now we knew, beyond a doubt, that they were back and that we needed to make some serious decisions. But first, I needed to hear what Lisa knew about Mandy's disappearance. I hadn't had a chance to sit down with Mandy, talk to her about what happened. Everything has happened so fast. Lisa, did you get a chance to talk to Mandy about what happened to her? Well, not when she first got back, Lisa answered. I was too concerned about you and the good Bigfoot staring at each other in the yard. We talked for a few minutes after you and Scott came in here earlier. I asked her if the Bigfoot was nice to her, and she said yes, uh, except for the girls and the kids pulling her hair a lot and sniffing her skin. She also said a nice mommy Bigfoot made her eat fish that wasn't cooked and that she didn't like how it tasted. Then, almost as an afterthought, she remembered that another one hit her on the head so hard it made her cry. She said that Sully screamed at him and pushed him hard into a tree and made the bad one leave the home, as she called it. She said Sully wouldn't let her play after that and that he carried her all over so bad ones couldn't hurt her. Did she say why she went with him, I asked? Yes, she said Sully woke her up when it was still dark out, and he asked her if she wanted to come to his home and play with the kids there. It took every ounce of my being not to cry after hearing that. My baby could have been killed today, and we may not have ever known what happened to her. After about five minutes of allowing my mind to run wild, I looked at Lisa and I said, You have to take the girls and leave tomorrow. Go to your mom and dad's or my parents, but you aren't staying here. And you are, she yelled. I don't think so. Screw it all. We'll go back to the city and start over, she cried. Lisa, you know we can't do that. I have to stay and find a solution to this problem. Brad? They will kill you. And what about you, Scott? I guess you're going to stay too. Scott nodded and then looked at Kathy. I want you to go with Lisa or at least go to your grandfather's. Well, we'll see about that, was all Kathy said. Kathy, do you know where the kid is that lived here? The one you were friends with, I asked. She looked surprised by my question. And after a few moments of thought, she said, He just disappeared, apparently. 
I heard from my grandfather after I left for college that he just up and disappeared. That's really all I know. Maybe you could call around in the morning and see if he's resurfaced, I said to Kathy. She nodded in response. Why don't you guys lie down and try to sleep? I'll keep watch, I said, sliding the chair over to the window. The wind had really picked up and the snow was falling hard. If there was something out there, I would have no way of knowing. Visibility was less than an arm's length. I had a nagging thought. Brisa said Yemma wanted revenge. Twice tonight alone. We were only separated by glass. They could have smashed the glass to get us. Why didn't they? Were they purposely trying to terrorize us and then kill us when we weren't expecting it? Why? Why not just do it and get it over with? And that, my dears, is the end of chapter 29. And it's starting to pick up. Okay, my little sweeties, I think that's going to be it for tonight. I hope you're enjoying yourself so far. Okay, don't forget, if you like it, hit the thumb. If you love it, hit the subscribe. And just because you like me, share the heck out of it. Really, really helps out. I didn't realize all that. But anyways, guys, you have a great night. We'll see you back here soon. Bye for now.